Hey guys, welcome back to the revision series. So in the previous session, we have successfully revised the chapter introduction to the audit. So in which we got familiar with the, what are all the basic terms which will be used throughout the subject of the audit. We got familiar with basic terminology like what is the meaning of the audit, what is the meaning of applicable financial reporting framework, what is the meaning of the term misstatement, what is the meaning of the term materiality. So these are all going to be the terms which we are going to use throughout the subject of the audit. Unless we are strong in that fundamentals, all the advanced concepts are not going to make any sense at all. So that's why we spend some amount of time in revising all the content of the chapter relating to introduction for audit. So now the next chapter which I am picking up for revision is going to be audit reporting. So very important chapter from the examination perspective, not just from the examination perspective, even from the practical perspective, even for your real life also, even your real life practice or job also, this chapter is going to play a very, very significant role. So that is going to be the next chapter which we are going to take up for revision. Once again, I am telling you very, very important, a significant weightage will be there in the examination from this chapter. And one more important thing here is this chapter is very, very interesting. It is going to be damn interesting. So I will try to revise all the content from this chapter audit reporting in a very short span of time okay right we will not rush through the things we will spend time wherever required we'll go deep in certain concepts revision will uh, the concepts that are not so important that will cover them quickly so i will do it in a proper way so that it will be beneficial for the students so the next chapter which we are going to revise is audit reporting see but before revising audit reporting it will be making more sense first if we pick one more small standard and complete that revision which is audit evidence so sa 500 we will try to pick up first and we'll try to complete it why because sa 500 is also one of the foundational standard if we get to if we become familiar with the concept of audit evidence then the revision of audit reporting is going to make even more sense so that's why what we will do is before we proceed for revising audit reporting chapter first we will quickly try to wind up audit evidence chapter okay not audit evidence chapter from the audit evidence chapter a small standard sa 500 standard will try to wind it up once we are done with that we can happily proceed further with the audit reporting so let us now try to understand let us now try to revise the concept relating to audit evidence guys if you remember from the previous chapters revision i have told what is the ultimate objective of the auditor what is the ultimate outcome what is the final outcome of the entire process of the audit so I have told you that the ultimate outcome of the entire process of the audit is auditor's opinion. So the, audit, the auditor is doing independent examination of financial information irrespective of uh, profit orientation, size or legal form, all that we have seen. But ultimate objective, the process of audit will actually come to an end by the auditor expressing an opinion. So and as I've already told you, opinion can be of two broad categories, either that could be a positive opinion or that could be a negative opinion. But if tomorrow someone is coming and asking you, for example, you have verified, you have been appointed as auditor of some company, Reliance Industries Limited. You verified their financial information, you verified their books of accounts, you verified their financial statements and you have given your opinion. Be it positive opinion, be it negative opinion. If I go into technical terminology, be it unmodified opinion, be it modified opinion. So you have given some sort of opinion. Don't you think if tomorrow someone is coming and asking you, boss, you have given this opinion, what is the basis for your opinion? on what basis you have given the opinion. So if someone is coming and asking you, you should have some information to prove your point or not. Obviously, right, it is not just in the audit. If you have given opinion regarding anything, for example, as I have told you, if someone has asked you your opinion regarding this revision series, you will tell your opinion, whether these revision classes are good or bad, you will give your opinion. But there should be some basis on which you have given that opinion. Even auditing is also not an exception. If tomorrow someone is coming and asking the auditor, boss, you have given opinion on so and so company's financial information, either that could be positive or negative. What is the basis? What is the found? What is the information on the basis of which you have given the opinion? Every opinion needs some underlying information. Even for expressing opinion also, there should be some information on the basis of which auditor has given the opinion. So that information which forms the basis for auditor's opinion that we are going to call in the audit terminology as audit evidence. What we are going to call it as? We are going to call it as audit evidence. So what is the simple meaning of the term audit evidence? The information which is used by the auditor to form an opinion. So what opinion you have given? There should be some supporting information. That supporting information we are going to call it as audit evidence. If you give the opinion without any evidence, that opinion is not going to have any value that opinion is not going to have any value. 
so most important thing ultimate objective of the auditor is to express an opinion but just in fluke we cannot express our opinion we need some supporting information to express that opinion that supporting information we call it in the audit terminology as audit evidence and as we all know just to because you are appointed as an auditor evidence will not come and fall in your lap take for example i am a practicing chartered accountant one day infosys company has came to me and told boss you have to act as an auditor for our company so I'm a practicing chartered accountant. I was appointed as auditor of the company Infosys. After the completion of audit, as I've just now told, I'm required to express my opinion. But as I've just now once again told, before for expressing opinion, I need audit evidence. See, just because you are appointed as an auditor, the moment you went, the moment you go inside the client's premises, evidence will not automatically come and fall in your lap. It is not some uh, uh, God's activity where you go into the, the moment you are appointed as an auditor, you will get a dream, all the evidence you will get. It is not going to happen. So in order to derive that evidence, we need to perform some procedures from our side. 100% that is required. If you want to get that evidence, it is not just going to come like to come to you just like that. You need to perform some procedures. So those procedures which are performed by the auditor to obtain that evidence, we are going to call that as audit procedures. We are going to call it as what? Audit procedures. So if tomorrow someone is coming and asking you, boss, what are audit procedures? Audit procedures are nothing but those procedures, those efforts which are put by the auditor to obtain the audit evidence, we call them as audit procedures. So by performing the audit procedures, we are going to get the information which forms the basis for opinion that we call it as audit evidence. And on the basis of that audit evidence, we are going to express our opinion. Clear everybody? Now, to go deep into that, sir, what is the meaning of evidence? What are different types of audit procedures? And what are the different methods by which I can obtain audit evidence? What are the various types of audit procedures? All that discussion will be there in SA 500. So SA 500 is a standard which is talking about all the foundational aspects, all the basic things relating to audit evidence, which is the most important step. The majority of the work, whatever we do in the audit, that goes for obtaining that evidence only 99% of the work whatever we do in the audit that we are doing it for the purpose of obtaining audit evidence only so now let us go into the topic of this audit evidence what are various types of audit procedures what methods are available that we will try to understand so to know that we have to go to SA 500 now so in the SA 500 also first I will try to start my discussion with types of audit procedures what are various types of audit procedures once again i am telling you guys this discussion is damn important if you don't get clarity about this discussion there is no purpose of discussing the remaining chapters only so please be active and listen carefully so what are various types of audit procedures so as i've just now told audit procedures means procedures performed by the auditor to obtain evidence and these audit procedures to obtain audit evidence can be broadly divided into two categories sir what are they number one risk assessment procedures Number two, further audit procedures. Whatever audit procedures which are performed with the auditor can be broadly divided into two categories. One is risk assessment procedures and the other one is further audit procedures. And this further audit procedures can be further divided into two categories. One is compliance procedures and the other one is substantive audit procedures. And in the substantive audit procedures also there will be two more categories. One is test of details and the other one is analytical procedures. The one is analytical procedures. So let us try to get familiar with this terminology. Sir, what is risk assessment procedure? What is further audit procedure? What is compliance? What is substantive? This we will try to understand. So this we will try to understand with a simple imagination. So for a few minutes, I want you to step into the shoes of the auditor. So this is you, he or she. So if you are he, this, if you are she, this. Okay. So whatever you imagine. So you are a practicing chartered accountant you have been appointed as auditor of some company x limited what you will do first as i have told our ultimate purpose is to verify their financial information and express the opinion so the moment you are appointed as an auditor will you immediately go into the accounts department and start verifying the books of accounts no so basic thing what you should do is the moment you are appointed as an auditor and when you start doing the audit first thing what you should do is you should get to know about the entity so what is this client X Limited doing? What is their business? What is their environment? In what kind of environment they're operating? Like to which industry they belong? What are the laws and regulations which are applicable for them? What is their applicable financial reporting framework? So I need to understand what kind of environment in which my client is operating, what my client's business is, what products they are selling, what services they are offering. So who are their suppliers? Who are their customers? 
how they are deriving the revenue so i need to understand about clients business i need to understand about clients environment i need to understand about clients internal controls also what kind of internal controls the client is having so more about internal controls i will talk about it in the chapter risk assessment and internal control but first thing the moment you are appointed as an auditor you will not immediately go to the accounts department and start verifying their books of accounts the first and foremost thing which you do is you try to obtain an understanding of entity environment and its internal control what you will do you will try to obtain an understanding of entity environment and its internal control for what purpose sir because by understanding the entity environment and its internal control you will try to identify you will try to identify and assess risk of material misstatement what you are going to do by studying the client's environment by studying the client's business by understanding their internal controls you will try to identify you will try to find out risk of material misstatement what is the chance of happening of misstatement in the financial statements where something can go wrong in the organization like for example i studied i'm i have been appointed as auditor of it company i went to the company i studied about the business of the it company i studied about their environment i studied about their internal control by understanding all that i came to know that in this client's it company revenue in the area of revenue there could be a problem there could be a risk of material misstatement chance of happening of misstatement the chance the probability we call it as risk of material misstatement clear so that procedures the first thing whatever we are going to do in the audit the moment we start doing the audit the first thing what we do we perform some procedures to obtain understanding of entity environment and its internal controls for what purpose sir to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement that procedures we call them as risk assessment procedures the name itself says risk assessment procedures you are assessing the risk how you are assessing the risk by understanding entity environment and its internal control clear okay sir i went to the organization i spent some one day of time two day of time i studied their entity i studied their business i studied their internal control i found out risk of material misstatement okay my risk assessment procedures are done next what i should do should i now immediately rush to the accounts department and start verifying the books of accounts no you should do one more thing here before you go to the books of accounts you should do one more thing you should perform something called compliance procedures sir what do i mean by that nothing but in the compliance procedures what i do is whatever internal controls i have understood whatever internal controls i have understood as a part of risk assessment procedures whether those internal controls are operating effectively or not whether those internal controls are operating effectively or not i try to test operating effectiveness of internal controls what i try to do i try to perform audit procedures to obtain audit evidence regarding operating effectiveness of internal controls those procedures i am going to call them as compliance procedures i will give you an example to make you understand so take for example once again let us take the it company example i have been appointed as auditor of some company infosys first what i have done is first one day two day i understood about what is the client's business what kind of environment what kind of internal controls they are having for example in the initial one two days when i was walking around the company i came to know a lot of internal controls like the company is having attendance mechanism sorry security mechanism if anyone has to enter inside the company they have to scan their identity card give their biometric then only the door will open now when it comes to the finance department i came to know some internal control like segregation of duties like accountant is writing a cash entry someone is approving it okay and also there are uh, i came to know that what can, there are some internal controls in their accounting software also i came to know that there is a voucher mechanism i came to know that there is a proper hierarchy for check uh, 10000 check can be signed by an accountant more than uh, 10000 to 1 lakh it could be signed by uh, deputy uh, deputy finance head more than 1 lakh that check should be signed by finance head only so like that there are i came to know these many controls are there okay you understood there are somewhere around some 20 internal controls are there in the accounts department you understood see just because controls are there that, that doesn't mean they are operating effectively now whatever controls whatever 20 controls i understood whether those controls are really working effectively whether those controls are really working effectively or not that i will try to perform procedures to obtain evidence those procedures i call them as compliance procedures there is other name for compliance procedures we also call compliance procedures as test of controls the name itself says you are testing internal controls whether the controls are working effectively or not you are testing so that's why compliance procedures or test of controls both convey the same understood okay
so you have been appointed as an auditor two days of time you have spent on performing risk assessment procedures some two days of time you have spent on performing compliance procedures if you pay close attention here till now you did not go to the accounts department our ultimate objective is to verify financial statements but till the stage of compliance procedures we did not go and verify even a single entry so some four days you have spent in the name of risk assessment procedures and compliance procedures now ultimately you have to come to your duty so now what i ultimately do is after i have tested internal controls now i will try to go to the accounts department get their books of accounts get their financial statements and i will start verifying those books of accounts and financial statements and that procedures which you are performing to actually verify the books of accounts and financial statements to identify the misstatements in the financial statements that procedures i am going to call them as substantive audit procedures so what are substantive audit procedures those procedures which you are actually performing to verify the financial statements books of accounts to identify whether there is any actual misstatement whether entries in the books of accounts are correct or not whether financial statements are prepared properly or not is there any error is there any fraud to find out that whatever procedures you are doing that we are going to call them as substantive audit procedures understood everybody so first procedure risk assessment then compliance then we perform something called substantive audit procedures now in the substantive audit procedures also there could be two categories for example i will ask you before i explain i ask you you want to know whether in the books of accounts of the client there is a misstatement or not what you will do if you want to know whether in the books of accounts and financial statements there is a misstatement or not you want to know it what is the first step you will do if you are an auditor what you will do what i will do is i will test the details like for example if expenses are there i will try to check the supporting documents if sales are there i will try to check the sales invoice and all if there are assets fixed assets i will go and physically verify whether the assets are there or not so these kind of basic checking we call it as test of details and these test of details also will be of two categories one is test of transactions test of balances if you are checking the supporting documents of incomes and expenses if you are checking supporting documents of incomes and expenses we call it as test of transactions on the other hand if you are checking the supporting documents of assets and liabilities we call them as test of balances common thing most basic thing so if you want to know whether there is a misstatement whether there is something wrong in the books of accounts and financial statements or not first thing what you do is you go and do the checking of the details that we call it as test of details there is one more way by which we can find out whether there is a misstatement or not where we will not do that routine checking of the supporting documents and all but instead what we do is we try to study the relationship between financial items and the non-financial items and by studying the relationship between financial and non-financial items also we can find out whether there is a misstatement in the financial statements or not the name itself says analytical procedures here you are going to do analysis you are not going to do the routine check of supporting documents you are going to apply your mind you are going to think analytically sir how do we think analytically by studying the relationship between financial and non-financial information like one simple example number of employees and salary cost last year previous year the number of employees were one lakh salary cost was 50,000 crores in the current year the employee count has increased to 1,10,000 but the salary cost of the current year is 40,000 crores only do you find something fishy here yes what is the thing you are able to find when number of employees have gone up the salary cost also should have gone up but to my surprise number of employees have increased but salary cost has come down so here you, by doing this analysis also you are able to mist identify the misstatement from this you can conclude that okay the salary cost might have been understated so here also if you find out here also if you pay close attention i am trying to find out a misstatement in the financial statements not by doing the routine checking but how i am trying to find out the misstatement is by studying the relationship between financial and non-financial items like number of employees and non-financial items salary cost is a financial item by studying the relationship between the two Actually trying to find out misstatement these procedures i am going to call it as what analytical procedures clear so to perform substantive audit procedures either i can perform test of details or i can perform analytical procedures clear everybody so whenever you go and do the audit this is what you basically do you might have been already doing this but you might not be able to identify the technical terminology this is what typically happens so tell me audit procedures are broadly divided into two categories risk assessment further audit further audit procedures are further divided into two categories compliance substantive substantive audit procedures can be done in two ways test of details analytical procedures understood 
text okay we understood audit procedures now so by performing this audit procedures what we get audit evidence we are going to get audit evidence we are going to get now there are various types of audit evidences there are what various types of audit evidences on the basis of nature evidence can be divided into three categories on the basis of nature evidence can be divided into two cat three categories oral documentary visual the names itself say whatever evidence which you have by way of words spoken oral evidence which is there in written format either in paper or electronic form that we call it as documentary evidence if you see something and get the evidence that we call it as visual evidence clear so on the basis of nature evidence can be divided into three categories then on the basis of source on the basis of source from which you are getting evidence evidence can be divided into two categories internal evidence and external evidence on the basis of source evidence can be divided into two categories internal external so now what is internal what is external internal evidence refer to that evidence which is originated or you can also say which is generated within the client's entity within the client's organization itself if the evidence is getting generated or originated that we call it as internal evidence on the other hand external evidence is something which is originated or generated outside of the client's business outside of the client's organization i will give you one simple example sales invoice sales invoice is it internal evidence or external evidence sales invoice is an internal evidence when your client is making the sale your client itself will give invoice it is generated within the client's business that is a internal evidence purchase invoice purchase invoice tell me is purchase invoice internal or external purchase invoice is external why because if you go and purchase the other person will give you invoice so it is getting generated outside so purchase invoice is an example of external evidence bank statement external evidence external confirmation external evidence debit note credit note generated by your client internal evidence so like that depending on the source we can divide into two categories now which one is more reliable between internal versus external which one is more reliable external evidence is little bit more reliable than internal evidence because since it is getting generated outside of the client's organization no one is going to have control your client's staff will not have control over it so that's why it tends to be more reliable and when you compare this three oral documentary visual documentary evidence is more reliable more trustable understood so this is one thing so what we have understood in sa 500 till now different types of audit procedures types of evidences now one more important thing here the term audit evidence whenever it is used in the subject of the audit that will always be preceded by two more terms which is sufficient and appropriate audit evidence so if you read somewhere the content of the standards they will say they will never say auditor should obtain evidence instead what they instead what they will say is auditor should obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence auditor should obtain what sufficient and also appropriate audit evidence so now it becomes necessary for us to understand what is sufficiency what is appropriateness sufficiency is a measure of quantity sufficiency is a measure of quantity appropriateness is a measure of quality so quantity of audit evidence the sufficient evidence means what these men for example if i have 10000 supporting documents 10000 is a quantity so that measure of quantity we call it as sufficiency whereas appropriateness refers to quality sir but what quantity amounts to sufficiency what quality can be called as appropriate there is no hard and fast rule what will be sufficient and appropriate that has to be decided by the auditor himself using his professional judgment so professional judgment is also one more important term which we come across very frequently professional judgment means ability to take the decisions using knowledge experience training ability to take the decisions using knowledge experience and training that ability of a person we call them as professional judgment so standards only say sufficiency is a measure of quantity appropriateness is a measure of quality but what amounts to sufficiency and appropriateness what can how much quantity can be called as sufficient how much uh, what quality can be called as appropriate that all has to be decided by the auditor using his professional judgment clear but however there are various factors various factors are going to affect so what quantity can be called as sufficient that depends on various factors like it depends on nature and size of the client it depends on risk of material misstatement it depends on effectiveness of controls it depends on quality materiality etc etc this question they will not ask you at the ca final level but it is important for us to have this basics this these are the concepts important for ca inter okay so you need not worry about it so sufficiency refers to quantity and there are various factors which will decide 
how much quantity will be sufficient similarly appropriateness means quality and whether evidence is qualitative or not it depends on relevance and reliability if the evidence is more reliable it will be more qualitative like internal external which one is more reliable external so i will say external evidence as more qualitative than internal evidence so like that appropriateness depends on relevance and reliability understood so there is one more last thing which i would like to revise from this essay 500 one more important discussion which is what are the various methods to obtain audit evidence see universally if you want to obtain audit evidence there are only seven methods available universally you get you go anywhere in the world so that's why i say the beauty of the subject of audit is it is a universal subject so country to country accounting policies can change but country to country auditing policies are not going to change it is going to remain uniform throughout the world if you are an auditor in india if you want to do audit of some indian company whatever methods you have the same methods will be applied even if you are doing audit of a u.s company in the united states because everywhere audit we have to do verification so that is the beauty of the subject of audit it is an universal subject globally the things are going to remain the same so across the world anywhere audit is happening if you want to obtain evidence there are only seven methods available so sorry so i caught up a little bit of cold sorry for that yeah so universal there are only seven methods available the seven methods are inquiry okay i will read it from here so these are the seven methods which are universally available for performing audit or for obtaining evidence inspection then we have something called inquiry then we have something called observation external confirmation recalculation reperformance and analytical procedures so wherever you go in the world if you want to obtain evidence these are the only seven methods which are available so what are they guys inquiry inspection observation external confirmation recalculation reperformance analytical procedures sir what does what does each of this method mean i will try to simplify it in a simple way inspection what do you mean by inspection checking of the supporting documents or going and physically examining the asset that we call it as inspection like as i've told if you want to know whether an expense is genuine or not you check the supporting document you want to know whether asset is really there or not you go and see it physically so checking of supporting documents or physical examination i call it as inspection so then what is inquiry inquiry means asking the questions and getting the responses if you want to get some information what you can do you are conducting audit you want to know some information you go to the client you go to the management of the client you ask them questions whatever information you want regarding that you ask the questions get the responses that we call it as inquiry see inquiry can be a written inquiry also inquiry can be a uh, oral inquiry also it is up to you anything you can use so two methods i have discussed inspection inquiry then observation observation means what looking at a process being performed by others say i want to obtain evidence regarding physical verification of the stock whether the client is doing proper physical verification of stock or not i want to obtain evidence what i will do whenever the management and the client's staff is doing physical verification i go there sit and observe so that is what observation looking at something and getting the evidence then we have external confirmation external confirmation means what for example if you are conducting audit of some client in the client's books of accounts there is one debtor amount is one crore you want to know whether that debtor's balance is correct or not what you can do you can go and directly call that debt you can go and write a mail to the debtor that i am an auditor of so and so company my client is saying that you are a debtor to them uh, tell me how much amount you are required to pay so like that a direct written response obtained by the auditor from a third party like um, confirmation from debtor confirmation from bank or confirmation from creditor confirmation from consignee so these kind of written responses obtained by the auditor from a third party we are going to call it as external confirmation we have one dedicated standard talking about external confirmation sa 505 which we will talk about it later then recalculation see recalculation today is not relevant nothing but checking of arithmetical calculations whether balance sheet totals are correct or not profit calculation is correct or not so nothing but additions deletions subtractions whether the mathematical calculations are correct or not you do it once again and check that we call it as recalculation this is no longer relevant today because today the calculation part is all taken care by software then we have reperformance sir what is reperformance reperformance means for example the client has the client's staff has already prepared brs but you also know how to prepare the brs so what the auditor is doing is he is preparing the brs on his own and is comparing it with the management's brs 
So nothing but one activity has already been performed by clients management or staff, but you are doing it once again to check whether it is correct or not. So this we call it as auditors independent execution of a process or procedure which is already performed by client. So that we call it as reperformance. Finally, analytical procedures. Analytical procedures I have already explained studying of relationship. In the analytical procedures, we study the relationship between financial and non-financial items. And by studying the relationship between financial and non-financial items, we try to analyze whether there is a misstatement in the financial statements. So that we call it as analytical procedures. So wherever you go, globally, universally, we have only, <coughs> sorry, we have only seven methods available. What are they? Inspection, inquiry, observation, external confirmation, recalculation, reperformance, analytical procedures. So all this discussion you need to have in the back of your mind. So with that discussion, I will, I will wind up SA 500. So SA 500 revision also we are done. Why I have taken up SA 500 revision is because having this knowledge is very, very important for us to have even better understanding of the audit reporting chapter. So since we are done with SA 500, we can successfully go ahead and revise the audit. So since we are successfully done with revising SA 500, now we will go ahead and try to revise the chapter audit reporting. So once again, I'm telling you one of the most important chapter, both from the examination perspective and also from the practical point of view. So what exactly we are going to discuss in this? What exactly we are going to, what kind of content will be there in this chapter audit reporting? So let me give you an overview. So once again, if you go back to the basics, when we have understood the definition of the audit, the ultimate objective of the auditor is to what? Is to express an opinion. The final outcome, the entire outcome of the entire process of audit is auditor expressing an opinion on the financial statements. He will independently examine them. And finally, whether they are giving true and fair view or not, he is going to express an opinion. So by expression of opinion by the auditor, the process of audit actually comes to an end. So this is every this thing is everybody clear with. So now the thing is, when I said auditor has to express an opinion, how he is going to express an opinion? How the auditor will express opinion? Will he come before the shareholders, take a mic and say that he is giving a positive or negative opinion? Will that, do you think that oral expression of opinion will be enough? No. So even the standards also says the same thing. When the auditor expresses the opinion, he has to express that opinion in the form of a written report. How he has to express it? He has to express the opinion in the form of a written report. That written report or that written document which contains the opinion of the auditor, that we are going to call it as auditor's report. If someone is asking me, if someone tells, if someone is going to ask me a question, sir, what is auditor's report? I will simply say it is an audit, it is written, it is a document which contains the written auditor's opinion that we are going to call it as auditor's report. Okay, so now we got one thing clear, the audit, the process of audit comes to an end by expression of opinion and that opinion will be expressed in a written format, which we call it as audit report. Now the next question which should come in your mind is, sir, how to prepare that auditor's report? How to prepare that report? So I am a practicing chartered accountant. I did audit of some entity X limited. After completion of my audit, I will give one audit report. Now, there is another practicing chartered accountant who has conducted audit of Y limited. After completing audit, he will express his opinion in the form of a written report. Now, don't you think there should be one common guidance for all these practicing chartered accountants to give one audit report? Do you think guidance is required? Yes. And also, do you think uniformity is required in the auditor's report? See, like the way today we are seeing all the financial statements of the companies are uniform. Uniformity in the sense they are comparable. So if you pick up the financial statements of Reliance and if you pick up the financial statements of Adani Enterprises, they follow a standard format. Why? Because that uniformity is very much required. When someone wants to do a comparison of these two companies, when someone wants to understand the financial data, if they are in a standard format, it becomes very easy to understand. Similarly, if someone is reading the auditor's report and he wants to compare two auditor's report, unless they are followed, unless they are prepared using one standard format, that audit reports will not be uniform and it will create a lot of trouble for the person whoever is reading that auditor's report. So like the way we have achieved the uniformity in the financial statements, the same kind of uniformity has to be achieved even in the form of auditor's report also. And how that uniformity can be achieved? So today if the financial statements are uniform, the logic behind it is we have dedicated accounting standards, schedule 3, so like that we have some rules and regulations for the preparation of financial statements. So if you want to achieve the same kind of uniformity in the audit report, even for the preparation of the auditor's report also, we need some rules and regulations, we need some guidance, we need some standard principles and procedures. So where that standards, where that guidance has been given? 
the audit report should be in this format these content should be there this should be the format this should be the heading this should be the paragraphs so that guidance has actually been given sir where that guidance has been given the guidance has been given in the form of standards on audit and particularly speaking sa 700 series is a, uh, is a series of the standards which is going to talk about the preparation of the auditor's report so which is series of the standards is going to contain all the guidance regarding preparation of audit reports sa 700 series of standards is going to contain all that required information and in that sa 700 series also particularly four standards sa 700 then we have sa 701 then we have sa 705 and also sa 706 so these four are the dedicated standards which will give all the guidance required for an auditor for the expression of an opinion for the preparation of the audit report so that's what we are going to discuss in this particular chapter so apart from these four standards there are also certain reporting responsibilities on the auditor put under companies act 2013 see standards on auditing has put some reporting requirements on the auditor in this four standards in addition to that in case if you are conducting audit of a company in addition to the standards on auditing companies act has also put some reporting requirements on the auditor and those reporting requirements are contained under 143 subsection 1 143 subsection 3 143 subsection 11 and 143 subsection 12 so like that under various sections of the companies act there are various reporting requirements that reporting requirements also we are going to revise in this chapter so this is going to be the main agenda for this chapter so first we will be concentrating on these four standards which are talking about preparation of auditors report in that also first standard which i will take up for discussion will be sa 700 which contains the format which contains the contents of the auditor's report so how to prepare the audit report what contents should be there in the audit report all that discussion has been given in sa 700 let us start our discussion with sa 700 so i will directly go to the contents of the auditor's report so how the audit report should be what kind of paragraphs should be there what information should be used what language should be used so first i will come to the contents of the auditor's report so if you see here in the SA 700, they have given list of various contents which should be included in the auditor's report. The list is something like this. There should be title, addressee, opinion, basis for opinion, material uncertainty relating to going concern, key audit matter, emphasis of matter, other matter paragraph, responsibilities of the management, responsibilities of the auditor, reporting on legal and other regulatory requirements, signature of the auditor, date of signature, place of signature, UDIN, so like that we have various contents now we will try to dig deeper into this contents we will try to understand what is there in each and every content what exactly should be presented that we will try to understand in a detailed manner and for the purpose of this understanding we will take help of some practical audit reports so we'll take the help of one or two practical audit reports and we'll try to learn the theory part along with that practicality also we will take hand in hand okay all right let me open one sample audit report for the purpose of our discussion so just give me a minute yes so for the purpose of our understanding i will keep open uh, one audit report so here we have reliance industries limited auditors report so as i have told we will try to learn the theory as well as practicality both hand in hand we will try to take it so let us talk about the first content in the auditors report so the first content which should be there in the auditors report is title title is nothing but heading there should be an appropriate heading to the auditor's report so generally in the case of the statutory audits the title which will be given is independent auditor's report so what will be the title generally independent auditor's report so like that there should be one appropriate title which has to be given to the standard the same thing you will be able to find even in here also so if you see here the first content is title there should be appropriate title so they have used the title independent auditor's report then after that after you have given appropriate title the next content which should be there in the auditor's report is addressee the audit report is basically a document through which you are expressing an opinion to whom you are expressing the opinion basically the persons whoever has appointed us they will be our addressee in the cases of the companies generally the addressee will be shareholders if it is a partnership firm the addressee will be partners if it is a sole proprietorship firm it will be generally that sole proprietor so depending upon the legal form of the entity you have to address the concerned person so since reliance is going to be since reliance is a company if you see here the address is to the members of the reliance industries limited so there is one appropriate address also so title is there 
address is there now let us come to the next content so after we have given appropriate title and address e, the standard says directly come to the point the main objective why you are giving that auditor's report the main purpose of the auditor's report is communicating your opinion no so first come to the point after you have given title after you have told address e, first directly come to the point express your opinion tell your opinion you have to tell your opinion on the financial statements now we will try to understand the various types of opinions in a detailed manner so we'll try to understand various kinds of auditors opinions as i've already told you in the introduction to the audit like in any world like the world in any, uh, in the world regarding any object anything any person opinion could be only of two categories either a positive opinion or negative opinion now since we are laymen at that point of time we use a simple terminology now we will give technical names till now we are calling positive opinion negative opinion but going forward when i say what are the two broad categories of opinion we have to use this particular terminology there are two broad categories of opinion one is unmodified opinion and the other one is modified opinion one is what unmodified opinion and other one is what modified opinion so unmodified opinion is nothing but till now simply whatever we are calling it as positive opinion that is the other that is a technical name for the positive opinion whereas modified opinion is something we got we are calling till now as negative opinion so now let us try to understand the definition of unmodified opinion and modified opinion so first we will concentrate on unmodified opinion sir when unmodified opinion will be given as i have told in simple terms it is nothing but a positive opinion so when unmod when unmodified opinion will be given the standard says if as an auditor you are satisfied you performed audit procedures you obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and if you are satisfied that yes financial statements are free from material misstatements after performing all the audit procedures after obtaining all the audit evidence you are convinced that the financial statements do not contain any material misstatement and also you are convinced that financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework nothing but these two are the objectives whatever we have seen for the entire process of the audit so after performing all the audit after performing all the procedures after gathering all the evidence you have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence that financial statements do not contain any material misstatement and also they are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework if you have that evidence that means you don't have any objection any remark regarding the financial statements and books of accounts then you will give unmodified opinion sir how to identify whether the opinion is an unmodified opinion you will not be able to find anywhere in the auditor's report unmodified opinion that term you will not be able to find out so what the standard has actually told us when you give unmodified opinion you have to use one particular phrase what the standard has told when you have to use unmodified opinion we are giving you two options only to only choose that two options don't use your own creativity don't use your own communication skills we will tell you what phrases you have to use in case you if you are giving unmodified opinion only use that only use any of the two phrases don't use your creativity sir which phrase i have to use if i have to give unmodified opinion so the phrase which you have to say which you have to use is this one you have to say in your opinion paragraph that financial statements present fairly in all material respects or alternatively what you can use the phrase is financial statements give a true and fair view so if you are giving unmodified opinion only one of these two phrases you have to use apart from that nothing else you can use so if you are giving a unmodified opinion your opinion paragraph should contain any of these two phrases either you have to say financial statements present fairly in all material respects or you can alternatively use the phrase of financial statements give a true and fair view only any of these two phrases you have to use so the moment you find these any of this sentence in the auditor's report that is what unmodified opinion so if i have to show you an example so this is the opinion paragraph so if you see this opinion paragraph i will come to the i will come to this part later this part i will talk about it later so the main opinion will be there in the second paragraph so if you see here in our opinion and to the best of our information and according to the explanation given to us the fors stand alone financial statements required uh, give the information required by the company act and they give a true and fair view so without any objection without any negative remark auditors are telling it is a what uh, financial statements are what giving a true and a fair view. so the moment you read this phrase which opinion should strike your mind so this is an unmodified opinion this is a what unmodified opinion 
clear everybody right so this is what regarding unmodified opinion okay we understood what is unmodified opinion now let us come to the most important discussion which is modified opinion which is what modified opinion sir when i will give modified opinion obviously it is very pretty straightforward when i am not satisfied with the true and fair of the financial statements i verified financial statements i verified books of accounts i have some objection i have some remark i don't want to say financial statements are giving true and fair view because i found something wrong in the financial statements so then i will not give unmodified opinion then i can't completely say financial statements present fairly or financial statements give true and fair view i want to add a negative remark in my opinion paragraph so if you are giving a negative remark in the opinion paragraph that opinion we are going to call it as a modified opinion now this modified opinion also you can give it in three ways this modified opinion also how many ways you can give this modified opinion also we can give it in three ways so what are that three different kinds of modified opinion number one is qualified opinion number two is adverse opinion and number three is disclaimer of opinion so when you have to give a negative comment regarding the financial statements and books of accounts you will give a modified opinion and that modification you can do it in three ways so qualified adverse disclaimer the qualified is also a negative opinion only adverse is also a negative opinion only disclaimer of opinion all these three are nothing but different versions of negative opinion but what is going to change is the severity of the negative remark is change, changing. So you, we will get to know once we understand when qualified will be given, when adverse will be given, when disclaimer will be given. We will try to, we will actually get to know which is more severely negative, which is less severely negative. Okay. So this thing, this different kinds of opinion, we will try to understand it with the help of few examples. Take for example, you are conducting audit of some company and this is a extract of the financial statements. You have fixed assets worth thousand crore rupees under current assets you have inventory some 500 crores you have trade receivables some 300 crores you have cash and cash equivalents some another 400 crores okay so totally somewhere around 2200 crores of assets are there and some liabilities are also there i'm not going into details even the total of the liabilities also 2200 crores so now you started performing audit procedures on this items of the financial statements this balance sheet you have started verifying so when you are verifying the balance sheet you came to know that fixed assets are all okay you are unable to find out any material misstatement in the fixed assets inventory also you are unable to find out any material misstatement cash and cash equivalents also you are unable to find out any material misstatement but in the liabilities in the liability side also you are unable to find out any material misstatement everything is perfectly fine except one item except one item so when you performed audit procedures you came to know that you obtained audit evidence you performed audit procedures and you obtained audit evidence and by performing that on the basis of audit evidence you came to know that one debtor's actual balance was 10 crore which was stated in the books of accounts but originally he is required to pay only 5 crore rupees so instead of showing actual debtor's balance as 5 crore rupees they are wrongly they are overstating that debtor's balance by 5 crores you performed audit procedures you have evidence for that you have proof also that management has overstated their trade receivables by 5 crore rupees so finally what i wanted to say is when you performed audit procedures on this entire financial statements you obtained audit evidence that there is a misstatement there is a what misstatement amounting to 5 crore rupees and this 5 crores is material 5 crores is a material amount so you performed audit procedures, you obtained audit evidence and on the basis of that evidence, you concluded that financial statements contain a material misstatement. Okay. Now you tell me, here can you say in your opinion paragraph, financial statements give a true and fair view? Do you think, can you say that? No, you can't say financial statements give a true and fair view. So compulsory, you have to add a negative comment. For that negative comment also, I'm giving you two options. I'm giving you two options. One option, option number one, directly telling financial statements do not give true and fair view you can directly go ahead and say financial statements do not give true and fair option number two you can do one thing you can say except except trade receivables which contain a misstatement of five crores rest of the financial statements are giving true and fair view. rest of the financial statements are giving true and fair view. except one or two items financial statements are giving true and fair view. 
you tell me in this given scenario which one looks more suitable i will say the second option looks more suitable i know there is a material misstatement in the financial statements but the misstatement is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong i agree there is a misstatement i agree there is a material misstatement but that material misstatement is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong there is not so big enough to say a financial statements completely wrong i can't say that so that's why i am not giving a completely positive comment but i am adding a negative remark by saying that except the trade receivables rest of the financial statements are giving pro and far but anyhow i am giving a negative opinion no negativity i am attaching to my opinion so whenever you find these kind of sentences in the opinion paragraph it will be a qualified opinion it will be what qualified opinion so when you will give qualified opinion one example one circumstance i have told i will give qualified opinion when i performed audit procedures and i obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence i have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence on the basis of that evidence i concluded that financial statements contain mistake i have evidence financial statements contain a misstatement the misstatement is material the misstatement is what material but it is not a very big misstatement to say financial statements are completely wrong so that very big kind of misstatements which make the complete financial statements wrong i call it as pervasive so here the thing is i performed audit procedures i obtained audit evidence i found a misstatement which is material but not pervasive it is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong so when i have sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and when i came to know that financial statements contain a misstatement that misstatement is material but not pervasive pervasive definition we'll see it in a by but for the time being now for the sake of simplicity understand pervasive as a very big misstatement to say completely financial statements are wrong here there is a misstatement i agree but that is not pervasive so in this case i will give qualified opinion and how to identify qualified opinion you will find the phrases like this modified opinion discussion and all is contained in ss705 so in order to understand different kinds of modified opinion we have to go to ss705 so this is ss705 if you see here how to identify how to identify the modified opinion is you have to use the phrases except except for the fx or except for the possible fx or the financial statements give a true and value so it will start something like this except for certain items financial statements give a true and value so when you read when you find this phrase this is what kind, this is what kind of opinion qualified opinion understood so i told you one circumstance where you will give qualified opinion now let me change some facts here let me give another scenario here okay so we'll copy this i'll take the same example to make you understand Wait. come on come on come on here we will paste it right so now i will give a little bit of facts we will change here so here once again let us take another scenario i am conducting audit of this financial statements client has given me this balance sheet so i am trying to perform audit procedures to obtain audit evidence so when i performed audit procedures i obtained audit evidence that fixed assets contain a misstatement of some 10 crore rupees i have evidence i have a evidence that there is a misstatement of 10 crores in the fixed assets there is a misstatement of 5 crores in the inventory i have evidence that there is a misstatement of some 10 crores in the trade receivables in the liabilities also i am able to find in uh, share capital i am able to find 10 crores of misstatement in uh, current liabilities i am able to find some 15 crores of misstatement so this is the case i performed audit procedures i have evidence and there is a misstatement in so many items so now here also you definitely can't say financial statements are giving a true and fair here also you have to give a negative opinion but here if i give you two options to choose from which option will you choose will you say financial statements are not giving true and fair view or will you say accept a list of items of financial statements is giving true and fair view? which one looks more suitable here in this case the first option suits more suitable yes or no so here instead of telling instead of fixed reserves instead of inventory except for trade receivables except for blah 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 financial statements give it true and fair view. do you think that is, does it sounds good no here the misstatements are very big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong here I can comfortably say financial statements completely wrong. Financial statements do not give true and fair view. So the moment you find this a phrase in the opinion paragraph, which phrase financial statements do not give true and fair view. Financial statements do not give true and fair view. The moment you find this phrase, that will be an adverse opinion.
So let us try to make out the circumstances in which adverse opinion will be given. Number one, you performed audit procedures. You have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. You have enough of evidence available. And on the basis of that evidence, you have concluded that financial statements contain a misstatement. And here, the misstatement is not just a material, it is pervasive. It is big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong. So the moment you find sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and you have misstatement and that misstatement is not just material that is also pervasive then we will give adverse opinion so what kind of terminology will be there in the adverse opinion so if you see here the financials in the opinion paragraph you will find the phrase the accompanying financial statements do not present fairly or do not give a true and fair either you can say financial statements are not presenting fairly or you can alternatively say financial statements are completely wrong they are not giving true and fairly. The moment you find this phrase, that will be an adverse opinion. So till now, I have told you one circumstance where you will give qualified, one circumstance where you will give adverse. Adverse related discussion is over. Adverse related discussion is over. Qualified, not it done. So one more thing is there. Let me try to come to that point. So once again, I will take this example, okay? So here, I will change little bit of facts. Okay, so I am performing audit procedures on this financial statements on this extract of the balance sheet. In the fixed research, I am unable to find out any material misstatement. It is perfectly fine. Inventory perfectly fine. Cash equivalents perfectly fine. All the assets in life, all the liability side also fine. But here the problem is regarding trade receivables. In the trade receivables, there is one debtor amounting to ten crore rupees. There is one debtor amounting to ten crore rupees. I am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence regarding that data. What I am doing? I am unable to obtain whether that data's balance is correct or not. So I tried to verify the books of accounts. I did not get convincing evidence. I tried to communicate with the data instead of calling. I am sending the emails. That data is not responding. The thing I wanted to say here is rest of all the items are all perfectly fine. But regarding one item, one amount, 10 crore rupees, I am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence. I am unable to conclude. I am unable to conclude. So now you tell me, in this case, will it be suitable for me to say financial statements give a true and fair view? Can I give completely positive opinion? No. So definitely, I also have to add some sort of negativity to my opinion. So here I will say two options. You can say, I am unable to express an opinion. In the opinion paragraph, you can say, I am unable to express an opinion. Since I am unable to obtain audit evidence, I can't express my opinion. One option. Or another option, you can say, except for trade receivables in which I am unable to obtain evidence regarding 10 crore rupees, rest of the items are giving a true and fair view. Except for trade receivables where I am unable to obtain audit evidence regarding this uh, trade receivable because of the possible effect that means even if this 10 crores goes wrong the possible effect of that misstatement is material but here it doesn't sound pervasive so you tell me which options will you choose i hope your the facts are there in your mind you are unable to obtain evidence regarding 10 crore rupees which option will you choose so i will say un saying unable to express an opinion is a little bit of extreme side which sounds more suitable is this sounds more suitable except for trade receivables rest of the financial statements give true and fair view so this sounds more suitable now now i have already told you the moment you find these phrases it is what kind of opinion it is a qualified opinion so the point which i want to conclude here is there is one more case where i can give qualified opinion the second case is i am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence regarding certain items and possible effects very important this term you have to use and possible effects of that undetected misstatements that means regarding 10 crores i am unable to obtain evidence even that 10 crore goes wrong the possible effect of that 10 crores is that means even if that 10 crore goes wrong the effect is material but it is not pervasive it is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong so i am unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence regarding certain item and the possible effect of that undetected misstatement is going to be only material, but it is not pervasive. In these two circumstances, I will give qualified. So finally, qualified opinion will be given in how many circumstances? Two circumstances. Number one, I have performed audit procedures. I have evidence 
on the basis of that evidence i have concluded financial statements contain a misstatement that misstatement is not that misstatement is only material but not pervasive second case i am unable to obtain audit evidence and the possible effect of that misstatement is only material but not pervasive in any of the circumstances so summary is whether you have evidence or you don't have evidence the effect of the misstatement should be only material but not pervasive then i can give qualified and i told you adverse adverse will be given in one case you have evidence available and you have concluded misstatement is material as all as well pervasive now there is one more thing we have to see so i am going to little bit extend my example so we'll use the same thing come on come on yes so now in this typical scenario what i am doing is in the fixed assets regarding some 50 crores of assets i am unable to obtain evidence regarding 50 crores of inventory i am unable to obtain evidence regarding some 10 crores worth of data i am unable to obtain evidence in the liabilities also some 15 crores i am unable to obtain evidence some 20 crores i am unable to obtain evidence so if that is the case you tell me can i completely say financial statements are giving true and fair view no here also i have to give negative comment now once again if i give you two options which options will you choose from will you say i am unable to express an opinion because i am unable to obtain evidence or will you say except for a list of items financial statements give true and fair view which one do you think will be more suitable in this typical scenario second opinion the first one sounds more suitable so here regarding so many items i am unable to obtain evidence and if all that items goes wrong the possible effect is not just a material the possible effect is even pervasive so if that is the case i can directly say i am unable to express an opinion on the financial statements the moment you find this phrase i am unable to express an opinion on the financial statements in the opinion paragraph that opinion we are going to call it as disclaimer of opinion what do you mean by disclaimer disclaimer means stopping yourself disclaimer of opinion means what you are stopping yourself from expressing an opinion so the same thing you are telling we are unable to express an opinion the moment you find this phrase that will be what disclaimer so when disclaimer of opinion will be given so the circumstances are i am as an auditor i am unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence and the items which i am unable to obtain evidence if that go wrong the possible effect what is that the possible effect see why i am using the phrase possible because i don't know whether they are wrong or right i don't know i am just estimating if that goes wrong so the possible effect of those items regarding which i am unable to obtain evidence is not just a material it is also pervasive in that case i will give disclaimer and what will be the wording when i use disclaimer of opinion so in the opinion paragraph i will say i am unable to express an opinion on the financial statements i will show you one example to make you understand this so here i have an example this is practical audit report of uh, everyday industries yes so if you go to the audit report part here and if you go to the opinion paragraph in the auditor's report just a moment yes here it is yeah so if you read the opinion paragraph so this is the opinion paragraph in the opinion paragraph if you see this phrase they are telling we do not express an opinion on the accompanying financial statements so the moment you find this phrase what kind of opinion it is it is a disclaimer of opinion understood so this is what three kinds of modified opinion qualified opinion will be given in two cases adverse will be given in two cases sorry adverse will be given in one case disclaimer will be given in one case and one more important thing which you have to remember is to give adverse opinion there must be audit evidence to give disclaimer of opinion there must not be evidence why because in the adverse opinion i am telling financial statements are completely wrong when you are telling something is completely wrong you should have compulsory evidence for that and in the disclaimer you are telling you are unable to express an opinion to say you are unable to express an opinion you should not have evidence understood clear and comfortable everybody so this is what regarding different kinds of modified opinion. understood so this discussion is going to be damn important this is where mcqs can be tested this is where a theory question can be tested this is even where a case scenario based question also can be tested a practical application oriented question also can be tested understood right so where all this discussion is there qualified in ss 705 different types of modified opinion are explained in ss 705 if you see here all these three are negative only severity is changing qualified opinion is less severe qualified opinion is what less severe 
whereas adverse and disclaimer are extreme more severe opinions more severe negative comments are getting included here qualified is little bit less severe understood now one more important thing which is important for the examination is pervasive what is the meaning of the term pervasive i told you in a simple way for the purpose of our understanding till now i was telling the misstatement which is not so big enough to say financial statements are completely wrong that we call it as pervasive so but there is one technical definition as we all know things uh, simple things don't work in the examination so basically all this is standards what they try to do is simple things they try to complicate in the same manner what they have done is the meaning of the term pervasive has also complicated simple meaning pervasive a very big misstatement but the same thing they try to say it in a very complicated way so here if you read it we can call a misstatement as pervasive that in the auditor's judgment if it is not confined to specific element if the misstatement is not restricted to one item if the misstatement is spread across so many items then we can call that misstatement as pervasive that's what even we have seen in the example also where misstatement is not just restricted to one account it is spreading across so many accounts so that we call it as misstatement that we call it as pervasive misstatement the same thing we have used in the example or sometimes what will happen is misstatement will get confined misstatement will be limited to only one or two accounts but the amount it will represent a substantial portion so if you see here even if it is confined to one or two items it represent a substantial portion of the financial statements like if i have to give you example for this take this financial statements only so in this financial statements imagine that there is a misstatement only in fixed assets there is a misstatement only in fixed assets and the amount of the misstatement is 600 crores here the misstatement is confined the misstatement is restricted only to one item but it is representing a very big portion a very big chunk of the financial statements it is presented then also we can call this misstatement as pervasive or the mistake the pervasive misstatement did not always happen only in amounts it could also happen in notes to accounts also if the management has made any mistake in the notes to accounts which are very fundamental to users understanding like for example management has given a wrong disclosure regarding going concern management has given what wrong disclosure regarding going concern entity will not be able to continue as a going concern but still management tried to uh, state in their notes to accounts going concern is valid so if the misstatement is happening in the notes to accounts also there could be pervasive misstatement that's what i told so in the initial class itself i have told we have to change our perception so whenever i say misstatement don't just imagine a mistake in the amounts there could also be a misstatement in sorry sorry guys yeah so the misstatement need not always happen only in the amounts misstatement even could happen in the notes also and even pervasive misstatements can happen in the notes so just keep that in the mind so this definition is also very important a misstatement can be called as pervasive in any of the three cases if it is not confined if it is not just restricted to one or two items it is spread across so many items even if it is confined it is representing a major portion of the financial statements or in relation to those disclosures which are very fundamental to users understanding of the financial statements then we can call that misstatements as pervasive clear everybody so this is what a few important contents from SA 705 we will come back to SA 705 later we will go back to SA 700 we are actually discussing the contents of the auditor's report there we will go back right so from where we have gone to where we are seeing contents of the auditor's report so we have seen title we have seen addressee we are looking at opinion so in the opinion paragraph what could be different kinds of opinion we have seen but one important thing you have to remember see everywhere i have shown you some two audit reports in the audit reports if you would have paid close attention the audit the opinion paragraph is very lengthy if you pay close attention here it is yes so if you see here the opinion paragraph is very lengthy this much opinion paragraph is there this completely is an opinion paragraph so actual opinion of the auditor will be contained in the second paragraph opinion paragraph contains two sub paragraphs actual opinion of the auditor will be there in the second paragraph but there is apart from that main opinion there is some other content also which is given apart from the main apart from the main opinion there is some one more paragraph also here now what is there in this paragraph so this makes me this uh, makes me come to the next point so what sa 700 says is 
you have to include opinion paragraph. In the opinion paragraph, you will express your opinion. Along with the opinion, there are some important things. There are some mandatory things which must be included in the opinion paragraph. Sir, what are that mandatory things in addition to the opinion which has to be included in the opinion paragraph? Nothing but I am referring to this first sub paragraph. So, what exactly? Oh God, it got closed. Okay, anyhow. So, as I have told, they are exactly referring to that first sub paragraph of the opinion paragraph. So, what content should be there in addition to the opinion you are expressing? So, SA 700 says in the opinion paragraph, you have to give a proper heading, opinion, one appropriate heading should be given. In addition to that, you have to state five things in the opinion paragraph. You have to identify the entity whose financial statements you have audited, nothing but name of the client you have to mention. Then you have to mention a fact that financial statements have been audited and you have to identify title of each statement comprising in the financial statements. Nothing but you have to say, you have to say financial statements contain balance sheet, statement of P&L, cash flow statement. You have to describe each element of the financial statements. You have to give a reference to the notes to accounts and in addition to that, you have to specify the date or period covered by the each financial statement component. So in the opinion paragraph, along with the main opinion which I am expressing, five things must come in my opinion paragraph. I have to identify the entity whose financial statements I have audited. I have to state the fact that I have audited the financial statement statements. You have to describe the title of the components of the financial statements. You have to give a reference to the notes to accounts and also you have to mention the period and the date covered by the financial statements. The same thing you will be able to find even in the opinion, even in that first paragraph. So quickly, for the sake of our convenience, we'll go through it once. Sorry, I have to scroll once again. Yes, anyhow, we got it very quickly. Okay, yeah. Just let me erase this. Right. So second paragraph contains main opinion. Now let us come to the first paragraph. Whatever five things we have seen, whether they are there or not, we will see. Number one, if you see here, we have audited the accompanying standalone financial statements of Reliance Industries Limited. In this one single line, two things are covered. They are identifying the name of the entity whose financial statements they have audited. They are also mentioning the fact that they have audited the financial statements. We have audited the accompanying standalone financial statements. So they are also mentioning the fact. Next which comprises balance sheet, statement of P&L, statement of cash flow, statement of changes in equity. Nothing but they have identified the components of the financial statements. And also it includes notes to the standalone financial statements. A reference to the notes is also given. Last item, you have to mention the period covered by the financial statements. So they are given, we are conducting audit as of, uh, for the financial statements as at 31st of March. So whatever five components we have read in the standard, the same five components have been as it is included in the opinion paragraph. So this comes to an end, uh, This the discussion comes to an end regarding opinion paragraph. Understood everybody? So three contents we have covered. Title we have covered, address we have covered, opinion we have covered. Next one, basis for opinion paragraph. Now the standard says, okay boss, you are giving your opinion. But why anybody should trust your opinion? Why anybody should trust your opinion? So that's why what the standard is telling is, after you have given the opinion paragraph, you have to tell on what basis you have given the opinion. You tell what on what basis you have given the opinion that you have to tell and that thing has to be explained in essay 700 in uh, basis for opinion paragraph what exactly has to be stated in the basis for opinion paragraph that also has been given here so essay 700 says in the basis for opinion paragraph four things you have to mention what you have to mention four things you have to mention you have to mention that you have conducted the audit as per standards on audit have to tell that there is a dedicated paragraph talking about auditor's responsibility please refer that you have to give a reference to auditor's responsibility paragraph nothing but if you look at the contents there is one paragraph talking about auditor's responsibility give reference to that auditor's responsibility paragraph in the basis for opinion only nothing but in the basis for opinion you have to say boss we have so many responsibilities to fulfill those responsibilities are actually given in a dedicated paragraph so you have to give a reference to auditor's responsibility paragraph and also you have to mention a fact that you are independent and you are also complying with ethical requirements. You have to say that I have done my audit in an independent manner. I complied with my ethical requirements. What are ethical requirements? We will see it in the professional ethics chapter. And also you have to say whether you have obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence or not. These four things you have to compulsorily include where in the basis for opinion paragraph. The same thing even you will be able to find at this in this case, so here it is a basis for opinion paragraph of the reliance 
so if you could see here the same four things whatever we have read in the material as it is will be there so they are telling we have conducted the audit as per standards on audit our responsibilities are given in auditors responsibility paragraph nothing but reference to auditors responsibility and they are also telling we are independent of the company and we comply with ethical requirements okay and we believe that audit evidence obtained by us is sufficient and appropriate so these are four things must be there in the basis for opinion paragraph now sa 705 says one more thing what sa 705 says is if you are giving unmodified opinion which opinion if you are giving unmodified opinion if you state these four things it will be enough if you are giving unmodified opinion if you state these four things it will be enough but in case if you are giving modified opinion in addition to these four things you have to tell in the basis for opinion paragraph the reason why you have given the modified opinion because of what reason you have given the modified opinion and also you have to quantify the misstatement what is the amount of the misstatement because of which you are giving the modified opinion that also you have to describe in a detailed manner where the basis for opinion so once again i am telling in case if you have given unmodified opinion basis for opinion paragraph only contain four things but in case if you are giving a modified opinion in addition to these four things you have to also mention because of what reason you are giving a modified opinion i have a literal example for this so if you look at audit report of adani enterprises limited so this is the audit report of adani enterprises limited so let us have a quick look at it so here the auditors have given qualified opinion first 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 yes okay here we have so independent auditors report so if you see here here the auditors have given qualified opinion and here they have given the basis for the qualified opinion if you pay close attention those four things whatever must be there in the basis for opinion paragraph here it is there whatever we have seen the reliance industries limited as it is copy pasted paragraph is there but in addition to that if you find come on sorry guys it is getting stuck So just quickly i will show and wind it up yes so in addition to this information there is the basis for qualified opinion is even more elaborated it is even more elaborated sir what is this extra information here this extra information is nothing but the auditors are explaining since they have given a qualified opinion why they have given a qualified opinion that reason they are explaining so along with the reason if possible they have to even quantify state the amount of the misstatement also so where it is mentioned in SS705 it is mentioned. So if we go back to SS705 just I wanted to take you through that important discussion. Yes. So here it is. So in case changes to be made to the basis for opinion paragraph in case of modified opinion. In case if you are giving a modified opinion what you should do. So number one we have to number one I will come to that later. Number two describe and quantify the misstatement. Because of which misstatement you are giving a modified opinion explain it and also if possible quantify it sir i am unable to quantify i am unable to determine the amount of the misstatement if you are unable if it is not practicable to quantify state the same thing that we are unable to quantify the misstatement you can state the same thing if you able to quantify tell the amount if you are unable to quantify state the fact in case you are giving a modified opinion because of wrong disclosure not because of misstatement in the figures management has given wrong explanation wrong notes to accounts that's why you are giving modified opinion then what I should do, I have to explain what are that disclosures which are misstated, which explanation was given wrong that I have to explain where in the basis for opinion. In case management did not give disclosure, that's why you are giving modified opinion. Management is required to give some disclosure in the financial statements, but they did not give it. That's why you are modifying. Then you have to say that non-disclosure because of which non-disclosure you are giving modified opinion. If possible, you have to include that omitted disclosure in your auditor's report if it is permitted what is the disclosure that was missed by the management because of which you are giving modified opinion if there is no restriction on you from law from law and from any law or regulation you have to include that disclosure in the basis for opinion paragraph you will give modified but in addition to that explain that disclosures also and if you are unable to obtain audit evidence that's why you are modifying i have told you you can give qualified opinion even if you don't have audit evidence also if you don't have audit evidence you can give disclaimer also even disclaimer is also a modified opinion 
So in case if you are modifying your opinion because you are unable to obtain audit evidence, then you have to explain even reasons for that inability also because of which reasons you are unable to obtain audit evidence. All this you have to update in your basis for opinion paragraph. And the standard SA705 says also one more thing. In case if you are giving unmodified opinion, the title of the opinion paragraph will just remain opinion and the title for basis for opinion paragraph will just remain basis for opinion. But in case if you are giving a modified opinion, the title of the opinion and basis for opinion paragraph also will change. As you would have observed in the case of Adani Enterprises, since the auditors have given qualified opinion, the opinion paragraph heading was qualified opinion and basis for opinion was changed to basis for qualified opinion. Did you pay attention when I have shown you that? Oh, it's not going to that page. So I will load it in my note writing app only so that we will not have this trouble again and again. So for one last time, just bear with this. Where are you? Yeah, here it is. So if you would have paid attention here, the title heading of the opinion par paragraph was changed to qualified opinion. Heading of the basis for opinion paragraph was changed, was changed to qualified opinion. Same thing will happen even for adverse and disclaimer also. If you are giving adverse opinion, opinion paragraph title will be changed to adverse opinion. Basis for opinion will be changed to basis for adverse opinion. If you are giving disclaimer of opinion, the opinion paragraph will be changed to disclaimer of opinion and basis for opinion will be changed to basis for disclaimer of opinion. So these changes are required to be made to the headings of opinion and basis for opinion paragraph also. So this is what the content which has to be included where in the basis for opinion paragraph. So we are done with opinion paragraph. We are done with basis for opinion paragraph also. Then there will be one more content immediately after that. There should be some content with the heading material uncertainty relating to Boeing concern. What is this material uncertainty relating to Boeing concern paragraph? What kind of information will be presented in this paragraph? This we will not discuss in this chapter. When we take up the standards on audit, when we discuss SA 570, there we will get to know more about this paragraph. What is this material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph? What kind of information will be included in this paragraph that we will get to understand it when we take up SA 570. So this will be for later discussion. After that, there will be some three special content. Number one, key audit matter, emphasis of matter, other matter paragraph. This we will have a separate discussion. First, we will complete SA 700 and 705 fully. After that, we will take up discussion 701 and 706. In that standard, we will come to know what is key audit matter. So to know key audit matter, we will discuss SA 701. And to know emphasis and emphasis of matter and other matter, we will discuss SA 706 immediately after completion of SA 700. We will complete all other contents. After discussing all other contents, then we will take up key audit matter separately, emphasis of matter and other matter separately. Okay, right. Then, then you have to include after these special things, you have to include a paragraph where you will explain the responsibilities of the management for the financial statements. So what are the responsibilities of the management that you have to include in your auditor's report? And particularly in this paragraph, you will talk about four things. In this paragraph, you have to say that management is responsible for preparing the financial statements in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework. You should also mention that management is responsible for implementing internal controls to make sure that financial statements are free from material misstatements. And also you have to include one line that management is responsible for making an assessment regarding going concern. Whether entity will be able to continue as a going concern or not, that assessment, making that assessment is also responsibility of management. That line also you have to include and even you should identify who is having oversight of the financial reporting process, who is looking after that financial reporting process, who is the person, who is the team, who is monitoring that financial reporting process, that authority in the organization also you have to identify. So these are four things must be included in the responsibilities of management paragraph. What are they? Number one, preparation of financial statements. Number two, implementation of internal controls. Number three, assessing the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Number four, oversight of who is having oversight of financial reporting process. So after these responsibilities of the management paragraph, the next paragraph which you have will be auditor's responsibility paragraph. In the auditor's responsibility paragraph, you have to tell all your problems, nothing but whatever your issues are there, whatever your responsibilities as an auditor are there. So all that responsibilities you have to mention, like you have to say that you are responsible for obtaining reasonable assurance. You have to give an audit report. Auditor's opinion is auditor reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance. Auditor is not giving guarantee. 
the misstatement can happen from fraud or error also but you will be concerned only about material misstatement you have to exercise professional judgment you have to maintain professional skepticism these are all qualities of the auditor which you might have read it in the ca inter level then you have to identify the risk of material misstatement you have to understand the internal controls you have to check the accounting policies you have to analyze whether going concern assumption is valid or not nothing but management will do assessment of regarding going concern whether that assessment is correct or not you have to evaluate it and also you have to check whether financial statements are prepared as per the fair presentation framework or not in case this SA 600 point we'll talk about it later uh, SA 600 will have dedicated discussion and also you have to communicate that and also you have to say that there are some reporting responsibilities on you you have to communicate certain matters with the those charged with garnance this we will discuss in SA 260 and SA 265 simply you have some communication requirement of those charged with garnance that you have to state and uh, various other matters you have to communicate with the those charged with garnance so all that responsibilities as an auditor whatever your responsibilities are that that list of all the responsibilities you have to include in which paragraph auditors responsibility paragraph so first there will be management responsibility paragraph where you will explain management responsibilities after that as an auditor what are your responsibilities that also you have to explain so i'm not going into details so that is what regarding auditors responsibility paragraph after that you will be able to find something called report on legal and other regulatory requirements nothing but apart from the standards on audit if there are some other reporting requirements of the auditor that you have to include in this paragraph like as i've told you have to prepare your audit report as per the standards on audit but in addition to that there are some reporting requirements on the auditor as per companies act also like we will see in this chapter there is some 143 subsection 1 under that six matters are there which are required to be reported 143 subsection 3 some 9 plus 6 some 15 matters are there which are required to be reported and under 143 subsection 11 which is nothing but caro there are 21 matters which are required to be reported so in addition to the standards on audit as per the companies act auditor is required to report on these many points sir where he will include that in the auditor's report in this paragraph in this paragraph as the name itself says report on legal and other regulatory requirements apart from the standard as per some other law or regulation if you are if you are having any reporting requirements use this paragraph here you can come and report it so like that you will have a one paragraph reporting on legal and other regulatory requirements after including all the contents you have to sign the auditor's report without your signature the report will not have any validity so you have to sign it if you are an individual practicing chartered accountant just you will mention just you will sign your name you will mention your membership number you will mention in case the auditor is appointed as a in case auditor appointed is a partnership firm partnership firm or llp if they are appointed as an auditor one partner will sign on behalf of the entire firm and while signing this partner should sign he has to mention his name he has to mention his membership number along with that he should also mention the firm's name firm registration number also you have to mention if you are an individual practicing chartered accountant signing the audit report just to mention your name your signature your membership number but if you are signing on behalf of a firm you have to mention along with your name your membership number you have to mention the name of the firm and also firm registration number you also has to be mentioned and you have to mention the date of signature on what date you are signing the date of signature along with that place of signature nothing but the city where you are signing it and finally UDIN also you have to mention without UDIN as you all are ever today chartered accountant signatures are not at all valid if they don't have UDIN number UDIN is a unique document identification number every time any document you are signing you have to go to the UDIN portal log in there a unique number will be generated unless and until you mention that UDIN number below your signature your signature is not going to be valid so even that UDIN number is also required to be mentioned so these are all the contents of the audit report so there are some four special contents are there which are which are yet to be discussed out of that four special contents one content material uncertainty relating to going concern this we will discuss in SA 570 but other contents we are yet to discuss what is the key audit matter what is the emphasis of matter what is other matter paragraph this is yet to be discussed now we will discuss them so with this overall almost all 700 and 705 discussion is over 700 and 705 discussion is over now we will proceed ahead and try to understand 701 and 705 706 sorry 701 will be talking about key audit matter and 706 will be talking about emphasis of matter paragraph and other matter paragraph clear everybody so first we will take up essay 701 
to understand this key audit matter paragraph what is this key audit matter paragraph in a detailed manner okay shall we do it let us do it now so SA 701 is a standard which is talking about key audit matters so let us go ahead and try to understand SA 701 so SA 701 title if you observe the title of the standard is communicating key audit matters in the auditors report see first of all let us try to understand what is this key audit matter what actually led to the introduction of this content of key audit matter see all the contents were earlier there like opinion basis for opinion auditors responsibility management responsibilities so all these paragraphs are there for a very long period of time but this key audit matter is one of the content which has been introduced after a certain period of time this content is not there from the beginning so this content the key audit matter has been added very recently so what led to the introduction of the key audit matter let us try to understand that first see key audit matter what actually led to the introduction of this matter is as i have told you today there is a uniformity required in the auditor's report today there is a uniformity required in the audit reports whenever you pick up two audit reports they should look similar so today because of the standards on auditing we have achieved that level of uniformity and in fact practically telling today we have achieved so much of uniformity that if you take two audit reports which contain same opinion they will look exactly copy pasted only name of the company will change apart from that nothing will change apart from that nothing is going to change why <coughs> see the standards has taken the standards has used strict terminology so in fact what i will say is in sa 700 when you download the bare sa 700 standard from the resources and if you go to the end of the sa 700 you will find something called appendix at the end they have clearly given what should be the format if you give unmodified opinion what should be the format if you give modified opinion detailed format has been given so today once you have done the audit you have decided the opinion you need not apply your mind what you have to do is just you have to download that sa 700 go to the appendix if you are giving unmodified opinion there will be a format for unaudited unmodified opinion copy that information paste it in a word file change the name of the company date etc do all that cosmetic changes audit report will be ready so ICA has actually reduced your work you need not use your creative skill communication skill to prepare the audit report just you need the copy pasting skill so because of that extreme guidance today audit reports have all become very similar exactly copy pasted information you will be able to find it now industry started crying see whatever we chartered accountants do industry will always have a problem see when audit reports were not uniform the industry cried and told a hey, audit reports are not looking similar we don't uh, we have we are having difficulty in understanding please make the audit reports similar now when ICA has put the effort gave the standards and we have achieved uniformity now industry is complaining hey today audit reports are all looking similar we are not getting any value addition by reading your audit report what the industry started complaining we are not getting any value addition by reading your audit report it is exactly copy pasted information if i read reliance audit report and infosys audit report if both the auditors are giving same opinion exactly copy pasted information i am not finding any value addition now isa has, ICA has to do something to bring that value addition to that auditor's report so that's why they have told okay you want more communicative value from the auditor's report we will do one thing we will bring one new content in the audit report that content will be called as key audit matter where our auditors will explain some of the matters which are most significant in the auditor's judgment from the entire audit whatever matters which auditor feel as most significant most important those matters auditor will explain like for example if i am conducting audit of infosys limited i found a very difficulty in obtaining audit evidence regarding revenue i obtained audit evidence but it was little bit difficult for me i performed more procedures i have to go through a lot of struggle i have to verify so many documents to obtain audit evidence regarding revenue so now what standard has told us okay you can select this revenue as a key audit matter explain how you have dealt with that revenue how you try to obtain audit evidence what procedures you have performed what difficulties you have faced why you have faced difficulty explain it now there is some other auditor who has conducted audit of reliance Industries limited now while he is conducting audit he faced difficulty in obtaining evidence regarding litigations and claims he faced difficulty obtaining evidence regarding litigations and claims 
Now, the auditor of Reliance Industries Limited will explain that litigations as a key audit matter. So, like this, now what will happen is for the key audit matter, it all changes from entity to entity. Whatever difficulty Reliance Auditor has faced, the same difficulty Infosys Auditor might not face. Why? Because your company is changing, industry is changing, circumstances are changing. Whatever I felt as significant in one entity, the same matter might not be significant in another entity. For Infosys, revenue might be significant matter. For Reliance, litigations could be significant matter. For Adani, something else could be a significant matter. So that's why what the standard has told is, hey boss, dear auditors, industry is complaining. They are not getting any value addition by reading the audit report. You do one thing, give your opinion, basis for opinion, auditor's responsibility, management paragraph, management responsibility paragraph, everything you do. But in addition to that, from the current year audit, whatever you have done, you identify a few matters which you feel it as most significant and explain about them in the auditor's report. So that guidance has been given and accordingly, this key audit matter paragraph has come into picture. Let me show you an example here. So here we have Adani Enterprises audit report and here you could see after the basis for opinion paragraph, they have included key audit matter. If you look at the key audit matter, like auditors of Adani has told, has selected contingencies relating to taxation, litigation and arbitration as a key audit matter. So might be the auditors of Adani has found difficulty or they have faced some struggle in obtaining audit evidence and they felt it as most significant area. So what Adani Enterprises auditors have done is they have explained this matter as a key audit matter. So first they will explain why they have selected it as a key audit matter. Why you are feeling it as most significant. So that reasons they will explain. Like if you see here the provisions and contingent liabilities relating to ongoing litigations. There are so many litigations which the company is going through. They are related to direct tax, indirect taxes, any other legal proceedings are also there. As at the year ended, the amounts involved were very significant. Whatever amount that is involved in the litigation, that is a very big amount. The assessment of provision or a contingent liability requires significant judgments. In estimating that provisions and contingent liabilities, a lot of assumptions will be involved. And it is very complex. The amount recognized as a provision is a best estimate of the expenditure. All these are provisions, litigations, contingencies, whatever they have created, that is purely an estimate. And the provisions and contingent liabilities are subject to changes in the outcomes of litigation and claim. Whatever provision they have created now, that actual liability might be different. So it involves a significant judgment and estimation to determine likelihood of outflows, etc. So they are simply explaining here why they have selected this matter as a contingent matter. Because there are so many estimates involved, the amounts were significant. So that's why auditor has decided this as a significant matter. They have explained it. Okay, now you are telling this as a significant matter. No, we should also explain how we have dealt with that. What kind of audit procedures we have performed. So that's why here auditors will here auditor is going to explain what procedure he has performed, what things he has checked, what audit procedures he did, what uh, what estimations, how he has checked the estimations, how he has uh, used the experts. So nothing but basically you are telling this as a significant matter. You have told the reasons why it is a significant matter. Should also explain how you have dealt with that. What kind of audit procedures you have performed. Similarly, if you see one more matter is also selected as a key audit matter. Revenue recognition might be auditors of this entity Adani. They might have felt difficulty in obtaining evidence regarding revenue recognition. So they will explain why they have selected this as a key audit matter. They will also explain how they have dealt with this matter. What audit procedures they have performed. One more, they might have faced difficulty in obtaining evidence regarding measurement of inventory quantities of coal. They might have, uh, they selected this as a key audit matter and they have explained why they have selected it as a key audit matter, what procedures they have performed. So like this, the auditors, whenever they are doing audit, so they have given so many key audit matters like this fourth one is also there, fifth one is also there. So like that some five matters they have selected and have explained them as a key audit matter. So now when you open the Reliance Industries Limited, audit report similarly the auditor of reliance Industries limited while doing the audit of reliance he might have his own difficulties he will explain those difficulties in his audit report now if someone downloads the adani report and reliance report they have this sub different different information of key audit matters now they will not complain no no audit reports are looking similar we are not getting any value addition i will say boss go and read the key audit matter you will get more value more communicative value so with that introduction key audit matter was introduced but here, one important point I want to clarify here. So most of the students will often have a misconception that the auditor of Adani, he has explained contingencies and litigations as a key audit matter. 
does that mean he is commenting negatively regarding this point just change your perception here so most of the people will feel that if auditor is explaining something there is something wrong about it no so if auditor has explained this as a key audit matter he is not giving any negative comment regarding this matter just he is telling what difficulties he has faced how he has dealt with the matter Similarly, if he is explaining this revenue recognition as a key audit matter, he is not giving any negative comment, just he is telling what difficulties he has faced, how he has dealt with the matter. So, you have to change that attitude whenever auditor says something, he is not commenting in a negative way. By explaining key audit matter, auditor is not commenting any negative thing, just for value addition, he is explaining you what difficulties were faced and what significant matters are there. That is the only purpose. So, this clarity you need to have it in the back of your mind. So, since we got to understand what is the purpose of the key audit matter, how it will be presented, we can quickly wind up the standard in just a few minutes. So, let us have a look at it. So, if we go back here, first of all, what is a definition of a key audit matter? So, key audit matter is something defined like this. Key audit matters or those matters that in the auditor's professional judgment, very, very important. That is that in the auditor's professional judgment, whereof most significance in the audit of the financial statements of the current period while you are conducting audit of the current period financial statements whatever matters that you have felt as most significant most important that you have to explain and once again here there is no hard and fast rule so which is a significant matter which is not a significant matter that has to be decided by the auditor himself using his professional judgment so the auditor using his knowledge experience and training he has to decide which matter is a significant matter it is nowhere exactly stated this will be exactly a significant matter no hard and fast rules auditor depending on facts and circumstances using his knowledge experience and training he has to determine it and one more thing if you want to explain some matters a key audit matter first you have to communicate with the those charged with garnets those charged with garnets are top level people in the organization top level management in the organization we call them as those charged with garnets so if you want to include certain matters in the key audit matter paragraph first go and communicate with the those charged with garments here also you have to uh, be very careful they are not asking you to take the permission they are just asking you to let them know that's all okay now sir what is the purpose of key audit matter why this key audit matter has been introduced i have already told you the purpose of key audit matter is to enhance the communicative value to increase the communicative value of the auditor's report to add more value addition to the readers of the auditor's report and most important thing communicating key audit matters provide additional information to the intended users that will help them to understand the audit report in a much more better way and this is also the important point most of the people have misconception that sir uh, SA 701 has asked the auditor to include key audit matters in the auditor's report now let us assume a typical scenario you are conducting audit of Reliance Industries Limited. Management prepared the financial statements and gave it to you. And after they have given the financial statements, while I am doing the audit, while I am preparing my audit report, management of the Reliance Industries Limited came to you and they told, Sir, there is one disclosure which is required to be given in the financial statements. We are required to include some explanation in the notes to accounts as per Schedule 3 and accounting standards. But we forgot to include it in the financial statement. But we forgot to include it in the financial statement you do one thing since we forgot anyhow in the audit report you will give a key audit matter paragraph now whatever disclosure we forgot to give in the financial statements you please include that in the key audit matter paragraph management is coming and requesting you i have to simplify management forgot to give some disclosure in the financial statements and now they are approaching the auditor whatever disclosure they have forgot add it in the key audit matter paragraph do you think it is acceptable do you think the purpose of the key audit matters is this? Is the key audit matter has been introduced as a substitute for including disclosures? No. Key audit matter has been included for the auditor to explain what difficulties and what significant matters he has found. Not that if the management forgets something, they can come and ask the auditor to include it. No, that is not the purpose. So that is the first point they say, communicating key audit matter in the auditor's report, it is not a substitute for disclosure in the financial statements that applicable financial reporting framework requires the management to make. If the management is required to make some disclosure, they are only required to do it in the financial statements. They can't come and ask the auditor to include it in key audit matter. The purpose of key audit matter is not that. 
And one more thing, some intelligent auditors have thought that, assume I am conducting audit of Infosys. While conducting audit of Infosys, I found a material misstatement. So when I found a material misstatement, what is my course of action? I should have given modified opinion. But one auditor is thinking like this. Okay, I will do one thing. I found a material misstatement. I will not give modified opinion. I will give unmodified opinion only. That material misstatement, I will explain it in the key audit matter paragraph. Do you think it is acceptable? If you find any material misstatement, instead of giving a modified opinion, can you just highlight it in the key audit matter paragraph? Is the purpose of key audit matter is that? No. That is the second point. Key audit matter is not a substitute for the auditor expressing a modified opinion. If you are required to express a modified opinion, you have to give a modified opinion only. You can't use key audit matter paragraph as a substitute for that. Similarly, it is also not a substitute for matters which are required to be included in material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph. Now, what is this? Is This point you will not get clarity, but just I will try to explain it. See, if you remember in the contents of the auditor's report, I told you one paragraph I will explain it in the SA 570. So, this paragraph, material uncertainty relating to going concern. There will be certain matters which will be included in SA 570 in this paragraph. If some matter is required to be included here in this paragraph, instead of including it here, can I explain the key audit matter paragraph? Is key audit matter paragraph is a substitute for material uncertainty paragraph? No. The simple meaning of that is if something is required to be included in the material uncertainty paragraph, the matter has to be included here only. You can't use key audit matter as a substitute. If I have to put it in a much more simpler way, whatever has to go here, here only it has to go. It should not come here alternatively. Okay. So that's what they try to clarify, sir. But what will come in that material uncertainty paragraph? To know this, we have to wait till the time we discuss SA 570. Okay. So that's what they say. It is not a substitute for material uncertainty. And also by explaining the key audit matter, auditor is not giving any separate opinion on any of the matters. He's not separately giving opinion on any of the key audit matter. Just he is explaining what matters were significant, why they were significant, how he has dealt with that. Understood now. The next doubt comes, sir, is the auditor required to implement a include key audit matter for every audit? Not required. As I have told, key audit matter was a recent addition. They did not make it mandatory for now for all the entities. Currently, key audit matters are applicable mandatory only for listed company audits. In case if you are conducting audit of a listed company, then only you have to include key audit matters in your audit report. If it is an unlisted company, there is no such requirement for the time being now. But in the future, they may make it mandatory for all the companies. But for the time being now, it is now currently mandatory only for listed companies. So that's what they say here. The auditor shall communicate key audit matters for audit of listed entities. If you are conducting audit of a listed entity, then you have to compulsorily include in the key audit matter. In some cases, the entity might not be a listed entity, but law or regulation might require. You. For example, some bank is there which is not listed, but Banking Regulation Act is asking you to include key audit matter, then you have to include it. If it is a listed company, you have to include. If it is not a listed company, then you have to check. Is there any specific requirement from law or regulation? Then you include it. If there is no requirement for law and regulation, and it is also not a listed company, no need to include it. And in other circumstances, the auditor himself might decide. If you are conducting audit of an unlisted company, if there is also no requirement of any law or regulation, but you using your professional judgment, you thought that, okay, in this company, even though it is unlisted, even though there is no requirement of law or regulation, if I include key audit matter, that will be better, keeping in mind the interest of the shareholders. So if you have any voluntary decision out of your own choice, if you want to do it, you can do it. But mandatory requirement only in the case of listed entity when there is a requirement of law or regulation. Other cases, the auditor himself can decide, but not a mandatory thing. Okay, next. Uh, one more thing here, sir, how to present the key audit matter? You have to include a separate paragraph, key audit matter, separate heading should be there. If you have more than one key audit matter, separate, separate subheadings should be there for each key audit matter. That's what we have seen in Adani Enterprises. One main heading is there, key audit matter. And for each of the key audit matter, they have given subheadings. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 key audit matter subheadings are there, no? So that format you have to follow. So you have to use a main heading key audit matter. And for each key audit matter, you have to use a subheading. And before explaining key audit matter, you have to give some 2, 3 lines of introductory information. You have to give some 2, 3 lines of introductory information. Nothing but one paragraph you have to give before you explain the key audit matters for clarity of the shareholders. I will show you that also. Yes. 
here if you see key audit matters are explained now but before that key audit matters they have given one paragraph they have given one paragraph where they are trying to say something what they are trying to say key audit matters are those matters that in our professional judgment were of most significance while conducting audit of financial statements these matters we have addressed while conducting audit we do not provide a separate opinion so this paragraph you have to compulsorily include this introductory information this introductory language you have to use before explaining the key audit matters the same thing they have told in the standard also so this introductory information you have to give same whatever we have read whatever we have read in the audit report same thing will be there key audit matters are those matters that in the auditors professional judgment were of most significant these matters were addressed we do not express a separate opinion and most important thing here if you don't have a key audit matter you are conducting audit but you did not find anything significant then what you should say you should say that there are no key audit matters you have to use a heading and say there are no key audit matters especially in the case of listed company you are conducting audit but you are unable to find any key audit matter you did not find anything as most significant then you have to say there is a no key audit matter that fact you have to mention if there is no key audit matter clear everybody only when it, only in case of listed and uh, legal and regulatory requirements why because in other entities key audit matter itself is not mandatory if it is mandatory but you don't have key audit matter then you have to say this clear next sir there are some circumstances where key audit matters are not required to be communicated even though you are conducting audit of a listed company or even though this is a requirement of law and regulation to report key audit matter but still in some circumstances you are exempted when sir if you are giving a disclaimer of opinion you are giving what you are giving a disclaimer of opinion so the standard has clearly told if ultimately you are giving a disclaimer of opinion there is no compulsion on you even though you are conducting audit of a listed company no need to include key audit matter paragraph the logic is very simple when you are giving disclaimer of opinion what is exactly happening there you are trying to say that you are unable to do the audit when you are unable to do the audit only how can someone expect you to identify significant matters from the audit sense only no it is quite illogical to ask you to report significant matters when you are unable to do the audit only so that's why the standard has told in case if you are giving disclaimer of opinion there is no requirement to include key audit matter paragraph because you are unable to do the audit we are not expecting the key audit matter paragraph from you and also there are some circumstances there are some matters which shall not be communicated as key audit matter like when there is a restriction from law or regulation sometimes law and regulation will put a restriction on certain matters this matter should not be communicated openly such matters you can't explain it as a key audit matter like for example some law has told if you are conducting audit of some defense related company no matter should be explained as a key audit matter or some sensitive matters should not be explained anywhere publicly those matters you can't include it in the key audit matter so when there is a prohibition from law and regulation or the auditor determines that because of communicating key audit matter instead of positive consequences there will be negative consequences like for example let us take some company which is going through a very bad phase let us take through some company which is going through a very bad phase take for example s bank s, ba s bank has been going through a very bad phase so here the auditor has found obtaining audit evidence regarding loans as bit difficult he wants to explain regarding loans as a key audit matter but since the status of the company is very bad when I, with a positive intention, when I explain key audit matter, but people may perceive it wrongly, they might feel that, okay, once again, S Bank has started something wrong with the loans and advances, and they might misunderstand it. With a very positive intention, there is no misstatement in the loans. You found a difficulty, that difficulties you are explaining. But since company is having a bad track record, even with a good intention, you try to explain something, people will perceive it, people will perceive it in a wrong way, in a negative way. So when you have such a feeling because of communicating key audit matter, instead of positive consequences, there will be negative consequences only. If you are of such a judgment, then don't include that matter as a key audit matter paragraph, include something else. Clear? And also if the auditor concludes that the matter is highly confidential or sensitive, in some cases you might find some information as highly confidential, highly secretive, that information also you don't include it in the key audit matter. So these are the circumstances where key audit matter shall not be communicated broadly if you are giving disclaimer no need to communicate the key audit matter and in other cases if there is any law or regulate if there is any prohibition from law and regulation or if the auditor feels that because of communicating key audit matter there will be more negative consequences or if the matter is highly confidential or sensitive these kind of information should not be communicated as a key audit matter and one more last thing sir 
you are telling which is a key audit matter which is not a key audit matter this auditor himself has to decide using professional judgment but it is very rude no sir standard should give at least some guidance where to look for key audit matters that standard at least should give some sort of guidance no yes the standard has given some guidance the standard has told what kind of factors you have to look or in determining key audit matter what you should take into account if i put it in simple language where you can start looking for key audit matters in what kind of areas you can start looking for key audit matters standard has given you some hint so whatever areas where you feel the risk of material misstatement as very high in those areas you can go for you can go searching for key audit matters or those areas which involve so many judgments or estimates those areas where so many assumptions and estimates are involved like provision contingencies in those areas you can start looking for key audit matters or if you find any significant event or transactions that occur during the period like acquisitions mergers from these significant events and uh, transactions also you can start looking for key audit matters so nothing but the standard is trying to throw some light where you can go and start looking for the key audit matters they have given three examples number one you can go and look for key audit matters in those areas where there is a high risk of material misstatement or those areas where significant assumptions and estimates are involved and also those significant events or transactions if there are any major events or transactions which have taken place during the year in that areas also you can go and look for key audit matters so that's all regarding SA701 so what we have understood in SA701 what is the definition of a key audit matter what is the purpose of communicating key audit matter and uh, when you should not communicate key audit matter when it is mandatory applicable and uh, what is the presentation requirements and what are the factors which you have to consider how you can determine the key audit matters this is what one simple standard very small standard important from the examination perspective so this is regarding SA701 so now we have one more standard left for discussion which is SA706 which is talking about two contents emphasis of matter paragraph other matter paragraph emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph very simple standard like SA701 it is very simple in a similar manner, SA 706 also will be very simple. Let us try to understand now SA 706. Just talking about two contents, emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph. So let us try to understand it. So now let us come to SA 706. So as I was telling you, SA 706 actually talks about two contents in the audit report. Number one is emphasis of matter paragraph and the other one is other matter paragraph. First, I will start my discussion with emphasis of matter paragraph. Sir, what is this emphasis of matter paragraph? The general meaning of the term emphasis or emphasize is to highlight. Is to what? Highlight. So, emphasis of matter paragraph is actually used by the auditor to highlight some information which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements by the management so the meaning of this is very simple the man generally who will prepare the financial statements as we all know management will prepare the financial statements so they will prepare balance sheet they will prepare p and l they will prepare cash flow statement they will prepare statement of changes in equity they will prepare notes to accounts so management in the financial statements whatever they have prepared they have already included certain information the management without their fault they have already presented and disclosed certain information but as an auditor you felt that this matter should be highlighted somewhere in the auditor's report it doesn't contain anything wrong the management has completely exactly stated whatever has happened there is no mistake from the management side they have correctly properly presented some information but as an auditor, you felt that this matter is very fundamental to users' understanding of the financial statements. Better I highlight it somewhere in my auditor's report. Then what you can do is, you can use a dedicated paragraph called emphasis of matter paragraph and there you can highlight that information which is already presented or disclosed by the management in the financial statement. I will give, I will give you one simple example to understand. Okay, take some statement of P&L. Take some company. If you look at the statement of PNL, there is statement of PNL revenue expenses all are there. Then there is one item PNL before extraordinary items. PNL before extraordinary items 100 crore. Then there is some extraordinary item. There is some extraordinary item. Some extraordinary loss is there. 
some one time e loss is there some 60 crore rupees of loss is there and p and l net profit after extraordinary item it was 40 crore rupees now what is this extraordinary item the management without their fault they have explained that clearly in note number 27 they have given reference here note number 27 now if you go to note number 27 there the management has clearly explained what is the extraordinary item so might be they have explained that there was a fire accident which has taken place is one of the factories of the company the total loss arising from that fire accident was 100 crore rupees but they are able to get 40 crore rupees of insurance compensation net loss from that fire accident was 60 crore rupees the same thing was reflected in the financial statements on the statement of the p and the same thing is reflected the management did not hide anything about it clearly they have explained in the note number 27 the details of that extraordinary item so you tell me did the management commit any mistake in the preparation of the financial statements did they hide anything from the shareholder no so you tell me if that is the case whether these are financial statements contain a material misstatement no financial statements are not containing any material misstatement because when we say financial statements are materially misstated when management is trying to hide something or management is trying to convey wrong information then we say financial statements are materially misstated but here as i was telling management did not hide anything without their mistake they have clearly told what has happened so we can't say here financial statements are materially misstated but management clearly presented that in the financial statements but as an auditor i felt that it is better this this is very much important for the users understanding of the financial statements because most of the users will not read each and every content in the financial statements they will just look at the bottom of the pnl they will think okay profit of the company is 40 crore rupees they might feel that this is the average profit of the company but if they read in a deeper manner if they read and go to that note number 27 and read it then they will get to know 40 lakhs is not the normal profit for the company the normal profit will be 100 crores there was one extraordinary event fire accident happened that's why this loss of 60 crores has happened that's why the net profit was 40 if this fire accident is not there the profit would have been 100 crores so the average normal profits of the company are around 100 crore rupees this user will become aware only when he goes and read that note number 27 but most of the but most of the readers will not do it so as an auditor i felt that okay management already presented some information in note number 27 but it is important for the user to understand it so what i thought is let me highlight this somewhere in the auditor's report so that the readers will not miss it sir how can i highlight it can i modify my opinion and highlight it you can't do it you can modify the opinion only when the financial statements are materially misstated but here you are only telling financial statements are not materially misstated so i can't highlight this by modifying the opinion so standard has given a way out you can do one thing in the auditor's report use one paragraph emphasis of matter paragraph in that you highlight what information you want to highlight also give a reference to the note number where they can go and find that information so in this case i will use the emphasis of matter paragraph and i will say i draw your attention to note number 27 where management has explained about the extraordinary item please go and read it so that any reader who is reading that financial statements he will not miss that point and he will make a correct decision understood so that's all this is what regarding emphasis of matter paragraph so simply if you look at the definition of the emphasis of matter paragraph emphasis of matter paragraph is a paragraph which is included in the auditor's report that refers to a matter which is appropriately presented or disclosed in the financial statements there is some information which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements just i want to include in my auditor's report because it is fundamental to users understanding of the financial statements clear so once again if i simplify some matter is already presented or disclosed in the financial statements you want to highlight it you can use emphasis as simple as that now so now they have given more about emphasis of matter paragraph so when you will use the emphasis of matter paragraph let us see the auditor shall include an emphasis of matter paragraph in the auditor's report provided the auditor would not be required to modify the opinion because of some matter which means that see you can highlight those matters you can highlight only those matters in the emphasis of matter paragraph which are not materially misstated if some matter is materially misstated the appropriate option will be to give a modified opinion not just highlighting it in the emphasis of matter paragraph so you can highlight only those information in the emphasis of matter paragraph which is not materially misstated management did not hide anything management did not convey wrong information some information is correctly presented that you want to highlight then you can use emphasis if some item contains a material misstatement the correct option is to give a modified opinion not just highlighting 
so very very important point you have to keep in mind emphasis of matter paragraph will be used to highlight only those matters which are not materially misstated and also the, if a matter is already determined to be a key audit matter just now we have discussed SA 701 if some matter is already determined to be a key audit matter then you can't present it once again in the emphasis of matter paragraph so if some matter is a key audit matter present it in the key audit matter only don't bring it in the em uh, emphasis of matter paragraph so two things they have told you can highlight only those matters which are not materially misstated which does not require you to modify the opinion and you cannot present such information in the emphasis of matter paragraph which is already a key audit matter clear next so they have given some examples also some scenarios they have given some examples of the circumstances which can be included in the emphasis of matter paragraph like an uncertainty relating to future outcome if there is any pending case going on management has disclosed in the notes to accounts but still you want the user to read that you can highlight that in the emphasis or if there is any subsequent event if any adjustment has been done for regarding the subsequent event in the financial statements management presented it but you thought the user might miss it out that also you can highlight it in the emphasis of matter paragraph or your client has made early adoption of the accounting standard your client has early uh, some accounting standard they have adopted a little bit early than the actual effective date this you want to highlight, highlight in the emphasis or if there is any major catastrophe like any calamity etc like fire accident and something that also you can highlight it these are only examples and once again this is not a conclusive list this is just a illustrative list these are only few examples ultimately it is a professional judgment of the auditor whatever you feel it as most important which is required to be brought to the user's attention there you can use emphasis of matter paragraph and how you have to present that so as i have told emphasis of matter paragraph should be presented in a separate section you should give separate side heading emphasis of matter paragraph in your audit report i think here it should be there just let me check whether here there is any emphasis of matter paragraph so in the adani report i think there is no emphasis see there is no requirement in every audit report that should be emphasis if required then only it will be given Mm. let me check anywhere else it is there okay here it will be there just for the sake of showing it to you i am taking you through this practical example i wanted to give yes oh no see here here it is there emphasis of matter paragraph you should use a separate side heading for that so use a separate heading emphasis of matter paragraph and also include in the paragraph a clear reference to the matter being emphasized and to relevant disclosure that fully describe the matter where it can be found in the financial statements so you have to even as i mentioned refer give a reference to the note number also where they can go and find it out where the reader can go and get more information so like as you see here they will say we draw your attention to note number 35.1 that means in note number 35.1 some information is already there i am giving you reference to just go and read that once next and indicate that auditor's opinion is not modified you should also mention that you are just highlighting this information you are not modifying your opinion because of this so that line also you have to add it okay here it is not there but generally at the end it, they will add a line so our opinion is not modified in respect of this matter so like that one line also you have to add it next uh now this paragraph is similar whatever we have read in key audit matter paragraph i told key audit matter is not a substitute for three things it is not a substitute for disclosure which is required to be given in the financial statements it is not a substitute for giving a modified opinion it is also not a substitute for material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph as it is for whatever three matters key audit matter paragraph is not a substitute emphasis of matter paragraph is also not a substitute for the same three matters so that's it regarding emphasis of matter paragraph that now what is other matter paragraph this standard is talking about two things one we got to know now what is other matter paragraph very simple so what they technically say is emphasis of matter paragraph is used to highlight that information which is already presented or disclosed in the financial statement in case if you want to say something which is not presented or disclosed in the financial statements you have to use other matter paragraph that's it so if you read it the same thing you will find other matter paragraph is a paragraph included in the auditor's report that refers to a matter other than those presented or disclosed in the financial statements if something is not presented or disclosed in the financial statements and if you want to include in the auditor's report then you can use other matter paragraph practically speaking we use other matter paragraph mainly for explaining auditors responsibilities so here only they have given 
we use mainly other matter paragraph for auditor's responsibilities like for example if you are not the branch auditor branch auditor was someone else you wanted to say that i am the principal auditor branch audit is done by somebody else where you can say that other matter paragraph you can say that or you are one of the joint auditor there are other joint auditors you want to tell that where you can say that other matter paragraph so if there is any addition of responsibilities or reduction of responsibilities to explain that responsibility matters we can use that other matter paragraph and finally one more thing they say here if you want to use emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph first you have to communicate with those charged with garnets first you have to communicate with those charged with garnets so if i give you summary if you want to come if you want to give a modified opinion first you have to communicate with those charged with garnets if you want to include a key audit matter paragraph that also you have to communicate with those charged with garnets if you want to include emphasis or other matter paragraph that also you have to communicate with those charged with garnets clear that's it this is what the simple and small standard sa 706 so with this we are successfully done with four standards which are talking about auditors report so sa 700 we are done 701 we are done 705 we are done 706 also we are successfully done with so this is what the revision of this four standards yeah